In this video disc, we will discuss the diagnosis, repair, and overhaul of the Ford 7.5 and 8.8 .8 cast center integral carrier rear axles. There have been a number of changes in the procedures for repairing these axles since the original service videotape was produced in 1978. So, the methods we'll be discussing here should be carefully observed. These axles are essentially the same in construction as is the ten and a quarter axle, and the procedures for overhauling them are the same, with some minor differences, mostly with the ten and a quarter axle because of its larger size. The methods and procedures we'll be reviewing are covered in this publication, Conventional and Traction Lock Integral Carrier Rear Axles, published in December 1981, and in the current body and chassis shop manual. In case there's a question on procedures at any time, the information in the shop manual should be considered the most current and should be used. Before beginning any rear axle adjustment or repair procedures, you should road test the vehicle yourself. Sounds and vibrations originating at the rear of a vehicle can come from several sources, and the rear axle or differential gear set is only one of them. Not properly diagnosing a problem can result in a great deal of unnecessary work and expense and a service return by an unhappy customer. When making your road test, slowly accelerate the vehicle until the maximum noise or vibration level is reached. Then play the accelerator back and forth slowly, backing off and applying it lightly. If this causes the pitch of the sound to change, the problem is either the transmission or the rear axle. If the pitch doesn't change, the problem is somewhere else. If the vehicle has an automatic overdrive transmission and is cruising in overdrive, drop it into standard drive. If the noise goes away, it is not an axle problem. If the noise persists, shift the transmission into neutral. If the noise still continues, the problem is either in the axle shafts or bearings, but is not in the gear and pinion set or transmission. When you have determined that the problem is in the gear and pinion set, put the vehicle up on a hoist and remove the rear wheels and brake drums. This is necessary to remove the axle shafts. After draining the lubricant, wash out the interior of the carrier and the gears thoroughly before inspection. This is very important because any residual oil left on the gears can add as much as three to five thousandths to the backlash readings, giving an incorrect measurement. After all parts are thoroughly clean, inspect for any nicks, scores, spalling, uneven or excessive wear. Any nicks or chips on the pinion gear or ring gear teeth can cause a clicking or ticking noise. Even small nicks can cause problems, so the gears should be examined in a good light. Brinelling in the differential case bearing cup caused by over-torquing the bearing cap can cause a roaring noise, as will spalled or galled bearings. The next step is to remove the drive shaft. Begin by marking the shaft and companion flange so the parts will be reassembled in the correct index. Assembling them wrong will cause a vibration in the vehicle. Then remove the drive shaft and install a spare slip yoke to prevent any transmission oil leakage. After the drive shaft is removed, rotate the gears by hand with the companion flange, looking for any sign of roughness that might indicate gear or bearing damage. Next. Mount a dial indicator and measure the ring gear to pinion backlash at three to four locations around the ring gear. The backlash should be between eight and fifteen thousandths, with twelve to fifteen thousandths preferred. The variations between the readings should be no more than six thousandths. The backlash specification on older gear sets used to be eight to twelve thousandths with no more than a four thousandths variation. This has been changed and the new specification should be used. If the backlash is out of the eight to fifteen thousandths range, the gear set is not shimmed correctly and will have to be reshimmed. 
This will be discussed in a few minutes. After checking the backlash, measure the runout of the gear back face. The maximum variation should be no more than four thousandths. Excessive runout can be caused by a warped ring gear or differential bearings, improper torque on the ring gear bolts, dirt between the ring gear and case, or a warped differential case. When making these measurements of backlash and back face runout, it's important to write down the readings for reference later on. The next step is to remove the axle shafts. To do this, you must first remove the differential pinion shaft lock bolt, and then slide the pinion shaft out of the case. With the pinion shaft out, push the axle shafts in toward the case, exposing the sea washer retainers, and remove the sea washers. Now, pull the axle shafts all the way out. Do not let them hang in the tubes, since this may damage the seal and bearing. And be careful not to let the splines damage the seals as they come out. After removing the axles, examine the bearing surface. Bearing wear at this point will cause a noise very similar to gear noise and could be the problem. Small flats on the bearing surface that can be seen by rotating the shaft in the light will also cause this same noise. Before removing the gear set, mark one of the bearing caps and put a corresponding mark on the carrier. This will identify the location of that cap for reassembly. The differential bearing caps must be installed in their original positions with the arrows pointing outward. Then loosen the bearing cap bolts, but do not remove the caps yet. Now carefully pry the differential loose inside the caps. If the differential is not tight and appears as if it could be removed easily by hand, it was not shimmed correctly, which can cause noise and shorten the bearing life. With the differential loose, remove the bearing caps and carefully take the differential assembly, including the shims and bearings, out of the housing. Immediately mark one set of shims, bearings, and cups to identify which side they were on. If any of them are reused, they must be replaced on the same side they were on originally. Once they are marked, they should be cleaned and carefully inspected for damage or wear. Now, make alignment marks on the end of the pinion shaft and on the companion flange. This will assure that the pinion will be reinstalled in the same splines. Otherwise, a vibration could be induced on reassembly. If a new gear set is being installed, this step is not necessary. To remove the companion flange, attach tool number T78P4851A to the flange with two of the drive shaft bolts and use it to hold the flange while removing the pinion to flange nut. Then bolt tool number T65L4851B to the companion flange and tighten the screw against the end of the pinion shaft to pull the flange off. Never use a hammer to remove the flange from a drive pinion shaft since this will almost certainly damage the pinion threads and could induce a vibration when the flange is reinstalled. With one hand holding the pinion, gently tap the shaft to drive the pinion out and remove it through the housing. The bearing and shims will remain on the pinion shaft. With the pinion out, inspect the rear bearing cups for galling or other damage and check the oil seal. If the bearing cups or seals need replacement, refer to the appropriate shop manual for procedures. Rotate the front cone and roller with hand pressure to check for roughness and replace it if necessary. Disassemble the differential for washing and inspection. When removing the ring gear, check the bolt torque and look for any dirt between the gear and its mounting face that might have caused excessive runout. Wash all the parts thoroughly in new solvent so you can see all the surfaces clearly 
and then oil the bearings to prevent rust. Here are some examples of damaged teeth to show you what to look for. Scoring, excessive wear, nicks, or chips. If either the ring gear or pinion is damaged, the gear set must be replaced. Check the differential side bearing cups for scores, galling, or spalling. The side bearing rollers should turn easily in their cups without roughness, and there should be no steep wear on the roller ends. This drawing shows the difference between a good roller and a worn roller end. If the bearing cup or cone and roller is damaged, replace the entire bearing. Check the companion flange faces for any damage that may have occurred during removal. The nut counterbore, seal surface, and front bearing contact face should be smooth. If there are any nicks, they can be removed. If there is major damage, replace the flange. Check the differential gears for free rotation. The side bearings won't have to be removed unless the differential case needs replacement. The bearing bores and all mounting surfaces must be clean and perfectly smooth, so you should remove any nicks or burrs. Now, with all the parts inspected and replacements for any damaged ones on hand, you're ready to reassemble the rear axle. To begin with, you must always install a new rear pinion bearing and shim when installing a new gear set. To select the right shim, use tool T76P4020A, which is assembled like this. Clean the bearing cups and gauge block. Then lubricate the pinion bearings with a very thin film of differential lube. Too thick a film can cause the selection of the wrong shim. Put the front bearing in the housing and then install the tool and new rear bearing. Screw in the handle and use a 3 8 inch drive to tighten it to a rotational torque of 20 inch pounds. Then rotate the gauge block several half turns to make sure the tool and bearing rollers are properly seated. Make sure the gauge block is positioned at a 45 degree angle to the center line along which the tube will be mounted. Center the appropriate gauge tube in the differential bearing bore Install the bearing caps and tighten the bolts to 70 to 85 foot-pounds of torque. Now, before checking for clearance, make sure the rotational torque of the handle is correct and that the gauge block is offset at the correct angle. If either of these is not correct, the wrong shim selection is likely to result. When the gauge block is properly positioned, Use clean, flat, undamaged shims to gauge the distance between the gauge block and the tube. The correct shim will just fit with a very light drag. Don't attempt to force the shim between the block and tube. Just a very light drag is desired. Anything else will result in choosing the wrong shim. After selecting the correct shim, Install that same shim on the pinion, along with the same rear bearing that was used during shim selection. If you're reusing the original pinion, you must first remove the old shim and rear bearing. This procedure is described in the current shop manual. Lightly coat the pinion shaft with axle lubricant and then press the pinion into the bearing, supporting the bearing in the press with tool T53T4621C. Now complete the pinion assembly by installing a new collapsible spacer. To reinstall the pinion assembly, first lubricate the flange splines and then install the companion flange. If the original pinion is being used, be sure to align the marks on the flange and the pinion shaft to avoid future vibration. Then Tighten the pinion nut using the holding tool number T78P4851A that you used to remove the nut. It should be tightened until you reach the correct rotational torque. While you are tightening the nut, 
check the pinion bearing preload with an inch pound torque wrench. It must be between 17 and 27 inch pounds for a new bearing and 17 to 22 inch pounds for a used bearing. Continue tightening the nut until the proper preload is obtained, rotating the pinion occasionally during the process to be sure the bearings are seating properly. You should never use an impact wrench to tighten the pinion nut, and if you over tighten it beyond the correct preload, never back the nut off to reduce the preload. Start over and use a new collapsible spacer and new nut. And if you do exceed the preload specifications, the bearing cups should be checked for Brinell damage by the rollers. Now, assemble the gear set by installing the ring gear, applying Loctite to the threads, and torquing evenly to 70 to 85 foot-pounds. Do not yet install the differential gears, pinion shaft, and pinion shaft lock bolt. Before starting the rear axle reassembly, Check to make sure the housing is perfectly clean with no grease, dirt, chips, flakes, or anything else inside the housing. Make sure the axle shaft and drive pinion seals are in good condition with no cracks, chips, or nicks, and no sign of leakage. The seals must be properly seated and not cocked. And the drive pinion bearing cups must also be properly seated without cocking. With the pinion properly installed, put the differential case and gear assembly with its bearings and cups in the axle housing. Then put a 265 thousandths shim number D8BZ4067AU on the left side. You should use new shims to adjust the backlash and preload the bearings, even though the original shims appear undamaged. Incorrect side shim selection may have been the cause of the problem in the first place. With the shim in place, install the left bearing cap and tighten the bolts finger tight. With the bearing cap in place, apply pressure to the left on the ring gear and begin sliding progressively larger shims into the right side until you find the largest shim that can be installed by hand with zero end play. Do not force a shim into place. Now, install the right bearing cap, making sure the arrows point out on both caps, and tighten the bolts on both sides to 70 to 85 foot-pounds. Then rotate the companion flange to be sure the differential assembly is free and not binding, and that the differential bearings are seated. Then check the backlash. If there is zero backlash, install a 20 thousandths smaller shim on the left side and add 20 thousandths to the shim on the right side to create backlash and check the reading again. It should be between 12 and 15 thousandths. If the backlash is less than 12 thousandths, the gear set must be moved to the left, away from the drive pinion gear, by decreasing the shim thickness on the left and increasing it on the right by the same amount. If the backlash is more than 15 thousandths, the gear set must be moved to the right, closer to the drive pinion gear, by increasing the shim thickness on the left and decreasing it on the right. Refer to the chart in the shop manual for the approximate shim thickness change to produce the desired backlash change. When the backlash is set within specifications, Replace the shim on each side with a new one six thousandths thicker to set the correct differential preload and reinstall. A new shim installation tool, number T85T4067AH, is available for this installation. With the new shims fully seated, tighten the bearing caps to 70 to 85 foot-pounds and then rotate the assembly to make sure it turns smoothly and easily. Then recheck the backlash to make sure the shims were installed correctly. With the gear set now installed, recheck the ring gear back face runout. It should be no more than four thousandths. 
If the runout was excessive before disassembly and is now within specifications, the problem was the ring gear. Either the mounting bolts were torqued incorrectly, or there was dirt or grease between the gear and its mounting surface. If the runout is still excessive, remove the gear from the case and recheck for contamination or nicks between mounting surfaces. Make sure everything is clean and then reassemble the gear with particular attention to proper torquing of the mounting bolts. Then check the run out again. If it's still excessive, the differential case is warped and must be replaced. When the back face run out is within tolerances, the next step is to reinstall the axle shafts. Begin by inspecting the wheel bearings and seals for any signs of rust, corrosion, pitting, nicks, or excessive wear. The rollers must turn freely in their cups. If the bearings or seals are damaged or worn, replace them, following the procedures in the shop manual. Then carefully install the axle shafts, being careful not to damage the seal with the splines, and start the splines into the side gear. Push the shaft firmly until the button end is visible inside the differential case and install the C washer on the button end. Then push the shaft out until the C washer seats in the bore in the side gear. Now slide the pinion shaft through the case and pinion gears. Align the hole in the shaft with the lock bolt hole and install and torque the lock bolt to 15 to 22 foot-pounds. Complete the reassembly by installing the brake drums and mounting the wheels. The final step before installing the cover is to roll a tooth pattern to check the tooth mesh between the ring gear and the pinion gear. To do this, first coat the gear teeth with white marking compound. Then rotate both tires in the direction of drive and coast. If the pattern is hard to read, connect the drive shaft following the procedures in the shop manual to put a resistance on the gears. The pattern should be inspected on the drive or pull side of the gears and should show contact in the primary area of the ring gear tooth surface as shown here. These are good contact patterns. These are problem patterns. This one is too high. It is caused by not enough shim or by backlash that is too high and will cause the gears to wear out prematurely even though it may not cause excessive noise initially. This is a pattern that's too deep. It's caused by too much shim or not enough backlash and will definitely cause noise in the axle. If you have a pattern that is either too high or too deep, you should recheck the pinion shim selection and make corrections before replacing the housing cover. With a correct gear pattern, the last step is to replace the housing cover and fill the differential with lubricant. First, make sure the gasket surfaces on the cover and the housing are perfectly clean and smooth. Then apply a continuous bead of silicone rubber sealant about 1 8 to 3 16 wide to the cover flange, circling the bolt holes, and reinstall the cover. No curing time is required for the sealant, but the cover must be installed within 15 minutes of applying the sealant. If it sets beyond 15 minutes, clean it off and apply a new bead. Carefully position the cover and install the screws finger tight to hold it in place. Then torque the screws in a crosswise pattern to 25 to 35 foot-pounds. This will assure that the cover is pulled down evenly and provide a tight seal. The final step is to fill the housing with the proper hypoid gear lubricant. Check the shop manual for the correct fill level for the vehicle being worked on. This will vary by model years and is not automatically at the bottom of the fill hole. This has been a brief review of the procedures for inspecting and overhauling the 7.5 and 8.8 inch Ford Integral rear axles to correct noise and vibration problems.
Careful attention to cleanliness, proper shimming, and correct torque measurements are essential to successfully completing these procedures. If there are any questions on instructions, procedures, or specifications, the current shop manual for the vehicle being worked on should always be followed. With proper diagnosis and careful attention to procedures, you should have no problems making a successful repair the first time and having a happy, satisfied customer.